Hello and welcome to the Capital Area Theater Show. I am your host, Jeremy Patterson, and with me today is my first guest, Mr. Tom Weaver. Now, most people might know him locally as an actor, but today I'll be talking about him, or talking with him, about uh, his first show with Gamut as a director? Uh, yeah, yeah, first show with Gamut as a, as a director. The, um, the Seagull. The Seagull, yeah, yeah. So, welcome, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for talking to me. This is great. So, uh... What uh, prompted the move from being on stage to stepping off stage and uh, directing? Um, well, I've, I've worked here full-time um, at Gamut uh, as, a, as a core company member um, for, for several years now. Um, and I started, uh, I started in the position of technical director, so I was building sets. And, you know, and, and in addition to that, you do, you do all the acting. So, like, Gamut is built with an actor-manager model. So all of the, the full-time employees, uh, in addition to acting and teaching, we all fulfill some kind of, like, day job um, at the theater. So when I first was here, it was, uh, I was a technical director. Um, and I, I was okay at that part of it, but I wasn't like I, I wasn't really on the level of uh, a, like like a scenic designer or anything like that. I mean, I could I could screw two pieces of wood together, and, and but that was you know. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to stay with the company um, when they brought in someone else to do that to fulfill that position, and then I moved over to the director of development, which primarily meant that I was writing a lot of grants and stuff like that, and I was still acting. Okay, um, but over the last couple of years as development director, um, I, I started um, being a part of certain conversations with, with Clark, who's our artistic director, Clark Nicholson, um, and Melissa, our executive director, uh, just about things that sort of extended past the realm of development and fundraising and building our audience base, but really in terms of like matters of artistic matters and stuff like that. So the the transition was was kind of slow and gradual, but what I noticed and what we all kind of noticed was like when when my job title changed to associate artistic director, my day to day really didn't change that much okay. like my position had just kind of evolved into that um, so that's that's kind of what what prompted that um, and also it just made sense I think as the company literally moving um, and, and, and going into a new facility, into a new space, um, the, the need for, for that position uh, also presented itself too. So that's, I think that that's, I, I, that's, that's kind of how it happened. Okay. You know, so yeah, all the stars aligned in such a way. So. Well, nice. Uh, now, so for your first venture, you chose the Seagull. Yeah. Uh, but now, just now that I bring that up, I actually thought uh, we first met doing Romeo and Juliet. Correct. So since then, I know you've done uh, the title role in My Name is Asher Lev and mm -hmm. Coriolanus, and I'm sure many, many uh, different characters in the Popcorn Hat shows and the yeah. Outreach shows. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could highlight any of your favorites before we get into your current. Oh, man. Well, um, you know, it's... I suppose the... Asher Lev will always hold uh, a special place in my memory um, and in my heart um, for, for a number of different reasons. And I think primarily was just the story itself was something that seemed to resonate with a lot of people. And it was a, it was a story um, that on the surface, it, it just seems like, well, this is one person's struggle to do their art. But really, when you strip everything else away, um, it... It, it essentially boiled down to a person's struggle for identity. And that's something that people can relate to on so many different levels. So it was really, it was, it was interesting to see how audiences reacted to the story and to the play itself, because um, in a lot of ways we weren't quite expecting that. So that, so that was, that was a, that was a really, really uh, wonderful part of that. But I, I think the, I think the thing that when I look back on it now, one of the, the thing that really stands out was that that was that was the show uh, where I got to really work with uh, with Jay Mifloff. Yeah, and uh, and he played my father uh, in that 
in that production, and it was, it, I mean, it, it was just it was just so much fun working with him, and then just being able to look back on that, and that was that was one of his uh, his last shows with Gamut. Okay. Um, and it was a it was a special one for him, and it was and it was a, a special one for all of us. So like that, so that that's one that like I it really stands out, and of course. I guess the other one would just be um, what we just finished with uh, Twelfth Night back in the fall. Um, it was an opportunity to play a role that I, I'd always wanted to play. and um, But I think on top of that, it was just the circumstances surrounding it. The fact that we had just gone through this big renovation project. We had just gone through this move and we had opened this new theater. And this was this was the first production in in the new theater. So it was it, it was meaningful on a lot of different levels, just beyond the fact that oh, I got to play a really cool character. So like so that was so that's something that's that's another highlight for me too. So, Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, it's written into the script about your ribbons and the like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> how is it? How is it? Uh, wearing wearing some of the costuming. Oh, that was um, what I liked about that was. Uh, we, in Twelfth Night, when, when Malvolio wears the, he wears the yellow stockings and he's cross-gartered. And you're, you typically see, it. obviously, that the stockings have to be yellow. And the cross-gartering, it's, it's always, it's typically black. And our costume designer, um, Jen Kylander, uh, chose to make them this, like, turquoise, almost teal color. And the contrast that it that it made not only just against like the yellow stockings, but also just with the the rest of the man's costume, because that was the only thing that changed in the way that he dressed. Everything else was very confined, very very like very like muted colors. But and then there was just this splash of just god awfulness happening like, below, <laughs> below his knees, and like and it was and it was it was it was a lot of fun because that that gave me even more you know, actor ammunition going into that scene um, because, you know, and it's, it's cool when a designer is able to, to, to kind of give you that as an actor um, where you can sort of see like, okay, Malvolio chose this color for the cross gartering. <laughs> he could have, cho he, he could have chosen just tr the traditional black cross gartering, but no, he chose this teal color yeah to accentuate it in such a way and so like so it, it added a bit more meaning to the fact that like when when he does go through that that transformation not just within himself but also just literally the, the clothes he's wearing you know so that that was that that was kind of cool that that was a lot of fun that scene was a lot of fun so, yeah. <laughs> well, well thank you for answering my question that's wonderful yeah. um okay so now moving on to the uh main topic of our discussion anton chekhov's the seagull yeah now, uh, full disclosure, uh, I am not a person who's read any Chekhov, so uh, any familiar terms that are going to be thrown around will be through research or uh, cultural osmosis. <laughs> but uh, I'm, a, I'm a friend with a member of the cast, several members of the cast, but uh, one of your leads in particular, and uh -huh. he says that you are a huge Chekhov fan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I, I wasn't. Always, um, I I didn't uh, I wasn't introduced to Chekhov uh, until until college, and my my initial my first impression with Chekhov was that all of these people are incredibly depressed. They're all sad. They're all stuck in these situations, and they just talk and they talk and they talk, and nothing ever happens. And I always thought that, like, I, I appreciated the language, like, the language was always very beautiful and everything, but I, but I remember, like, when in college, um, you know, I, I really, it, I didn't get it. I didn't get, like, why are, so, why, are, why are we doing these same four plays over and over and over again? Like, his four play, the, the Seagull, Uncle Vanya, Three Sisters, and the Cherry Orchard. And... I mean, aside from like other one acts that he's written and, and Ivanov, they're, these are the four that just, they, they're done so much. And I, I didn't get it. I didn't understand. I was like, why do people want to see this? And so I just sort of filed Chekhov away. I was just like, okay, it's just the thing that's, the thing that you just have to appreciate and try to appreciate. It's like, you know, you know, like forcing the oatmeal down every morning. So you got to do it. Um, so... 
And it wasn't until uh, a few years ago that I picked up um, my copy, like my anthology of those those same four plays. Yeah. And uh, I reread them, and what I found was just so rich and so so astonishing in the way that. Uh, the, the, and, and the subtleties of, of his writing and how he's able to write these scenes that it seems like they aren't about anything. It seems like nothing happens, but there is so much that's happening that he doesn't necessarily force feed you as, as a playwright. And he didn't do any of that in his short stories either. And what's, what's really fascinating about it is the trust that Chekhov puts not only in his reader, but the trust that he puts in the actors and the trust that he puts in the audience because there is so much that he leaves out and so much that he leaves up to you as an actor to figure out and so much that he leaves to the audience and he doesn't really tie anything up with a pretty little bow um, and says here's the lesson that we have to learn from this it's here's this story and now the most important part of the play is actually going to happen when you leave this theater and you start, talk, you start talking about, well, well why, why did this happen? Why did this person say that? And then you start to realize it wasn't just people sitting in a room talking. There was a lot of, there's a lot of action in the play, but it's just a different kind of action than what we're used to. And, and it, was just, it was extremely eye-opening to me. And, and I think the reason that I, I had that change and I kind of evolved in the way that I feel about him was that when I was in college, I knew everything. You know what I mean? Like, I was, you know, it's just like, I, I know exactly what theater needs to be. I know yeah. what acting is, and I know what plays are, man. And I'm, you know, so this Chekhov stuff, okay. So, like, I didn't really, like, you know, and, like, and that's, and, and, you know, it just comes from, you know, just being young and, you yeah, know, and all yeah. that stuff. But, like, um, and what I like to say is that, like, after about 10 years or more of just being chewed up and, and, and kicked around by life a little bit more. Um, and then you come back to it and you start to see what he was doing and you start to see the stuff that he was really playing with. And suddenly these plays that seemed so depressing, um, actually became like pretty funny. Oh, okay. You know? And so like, so there, there is a, there is an element of comedy and he calls, he calls the seagull a comedy, which okay. is an odd thing when you, when you lay out on the, on the page, the events that happen and ultimately how it ends, but um, but he but he refers to it as a comedy, and I can see why. So okay, yeah. So you went back to check off, and you picked up the anthology of four plays, mm -hmm. and uh, you're you're a fan. So when you get this opportunity, did you decide that you would ask to do a play in general, and then they said you can pick a play, and mm -hmm. then you said okay, I want to do check off, yep. and then you personally had to narrow it down out of those four. How did you come to the seagull? Well, um, what happened was uh, Clark uh, approached me, and he he had said uh, you know, he was thinking about the coming seasons, and he said I I I would like you to direct something, and um, and like my jaw dropped, you know. I mean, it was it was I I didn't expect that, um, and even more so, I did not expect him to say the next thing, which was so he said so you know, come back to me with a few ideas about what you might want to direct. And, I mean, talking about, like, someone putting trust in somebody, like, that yeah. that meant so much to me, um, you know, coming from someone that I respect and someone that, that I consider to be my mentor, um, for him to to kind of leave that to me what was, it, it, it meant the world to me. And, and, I, and I didn't take it lightly. So I, I had a few ideas about, about what I had wanted to do. Um, and I thought of Chekhov simply because, uh, Gamut has done Chekhov before. It was a while ago and it was, it was a series of, of his one acts okay. that they did, but, but Gamut has not produced a full length Chekhov play. Um, and, and Chekhov is, is, it, he fits within our mission. He's a, he, it's, he's a classic writer. Yeah. Um, and I came to the Seagull for a couple of reasons. One, because that was, that was... It is considered his first of the major dramas of the four. Okay. That was the one that was that was uh, that was produced that really 
changed the course of what modern theater was going to be. Okay. Um, when, when audiences saw it, they'd never seen anything like that before. They'd never seen a play structured in such a way. And, um, and they'd also never seen performances given in such a way. And I can talk more about that later. But like, um, so it was, it was revolutionary in a way for its time. And uh, Chekhov, along with Ibsen, sort of carved out this path um, to what we now consider to be quote-unquote modern drama. So to me, that, that seemed like a logical place to start. Um, and truth be told, it also opens the door for like, okay, well, we did the first one first, so yeah, maybe we yeah. do the second one second. Okay. Third one, you know, so, like, so maybe if we get to do all four of them, you know, and then we end with the cherry orchard. Um, so, so that was in my mind, too. But there was always something about the seagull that didn't sit well with me. And when I say it didn't sit well, it, there's something about it that, that scared me. And I, I couldn't put my finger on it, but there is just something very, very haunting and very elusive about, about that story. And I took that as a sign as, well, if, then that's the one that you need to do. And I hope that's the one he says yes to when I present it. Because, um, like I said, I didn't take, I didn't take Clark's um, ask lightly. So I figured I need to, I need to approach him with something that's going to be a challenge. Um, and not just a challenge, but also something that like I can take a bite out of and just, th and the company itself can really take a bite out of and, and figure out what, what this thing is. Now, now you said, uh, you've used the word trust at two different points, uh, mm -hmm. in our discussion. One, you said that Chekhov trusts his actors and, mm -hmm. uh, his audience, and you said that you uh, respect a lot of the trust that Clark put in you. So, you have, I'm assuming, other options that you take to him. Right. <clears throat> Why include the one that frightens you <laughs> when you have all the all this trust on your side? Like, was, yeah. was it just the, the actors and the artists' risk of, you know, wanting to be in a place where, you know, you could push yourself, or...? I think that's, I think that is. I think that's what it is. Um, because I, I also wanted to to make sure that it was something that wasn't going to be safe. Okay. You know, and, and I, and, and those are all ultimately the things that, the things that scare us a little, especially, you know, as artists, whether you're, a, you're an actor, you're a writer, a dancer, whatever. I think that the things that really scare you or the things that, that are, are, they leave you a little unsettled, or you're just like, I, I don't quite know what I would do with that. I think those are the, to me, that's something that I'm like, well, let's figure it out. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, and I think ultimately, as, as they always say, like, the greater the risk, the, the, the greater the potential of the reward. And, you know, so it's, and, and working on it has been extremely rewarding. And, I mean, I don't know what people are going to think of it, but, like, it's, it's, um, it's been a very rewarding thing to work on and to figure out because it's also important to me uh, that as I figure out what this play is and what this story is, I'm figuring it out along with the people that I'm working parallel with. Okay. Um, so that it's not just me dictating absolutely everything, that it's we're all sitting at this table and we all have to eat the meal that is the seagull. Yeah. So let's so let's all figure out you know all, all that stuff. So that so that's I think that that's that's where it comes from. So it's trust, but it's also you know you you, you need to push yourself to do that stuff that that scares you. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, well, can I possibly pry any of the other <laughs> options that you were give that you yeah. gave out of you, or would yeah. you or are you holding on to those and keeping those close to the vest in in case of <laughs> well, future productions? Well, it was something that we like. I I can say that um, you know we were also looking at playwrights that we haven't gotten to yet, and and obviously Chekhov was one of them. Um, Ibsen is another. Okay. So so we were thinking um, so that there was some Ibsen along along in there. Um, it's been a while since we've since we've done Tennessee Williams. Okay. Um, so, so Tennessee Williams was in there as well. Uh, it, it does seem like it was like 
20 years ago that he asked me this. So <laughs> it's hard, it's like hard for me to remember what exactly was on that list. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to, like for a while I was considering um, uh, A Doll's House, um, Ibsen's a, Doll, a Doll's House. And, 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 I, and I think that, we, that, that, that it is still on the table in, in terms of stuff like that. But, uh, but I've also come around to, I, I wonder, as a man, should I be directing A Doll's House? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I mean, and of course, I mean, it's not, it's not to say that, that I shouldn't, but like, I, I wondered, like, I, I, was, I had to like kind of have a conversation with myself and just be like, okay, can you, are you going to be able to tell all aspects of that story respectfully? And I think that I, I think that I would to the best of my ability, you know, but like, it's, um, I don't know, it's just, that's also another thing to consider. Yeah, you know? definitely. So, yeah. But the, the, so those were some of the things that were on the list. Um, but like I said, it's just, it seems like it was so long ago. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, Shakespeare wasn't on it. Um, and I, and I think I'm, I, I will wait until Clark asks me, what Shakespeare do you want to do? Okay. Um, before I, before I suggest that. Will you volunteer any, yeah, any of those? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now, since the last question took you about 20 years ago into the past, yeah. we can move forward a little bit and, yeah. uh, wondered if you would be willing to talk, uh, not really about your process, unless you'd like to, I don't, I don't know how, uh, you feel as an artist about talking about something while you're in the middle of it, mm. but uh, a chance to discuss any of your cast that you have for this show, uh, and then uh, specifically up front the fact that I don't know if the show is written to have a specific race, but you have a mixed minority cast, like minorities mm -hmm. in your cast. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, to start with, just the cast in general, there was, uh, I, there, there was, there was um, a wealth of people that came out to audition for this, um, which, which warmed my heart. And it, it was, it, it was wonderful to, to have such a large pool of people to, to choose from and people that seemed like they really wanted to, to work on this. Um, so that, that was great. And there were so many amazing auditions and, and it was, it was a very difficult process in terms of choosing, um, choosing the people that, that would be telling this story. Um, so, uh, so I, I really was fortunate in that respect. Um, and the day of casting was one of the hardest of my life. You know, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's they're very difficult decisions to make, but, um, I'm so, so happy with the group that I have. Um, and it's, and they're, and they came at it, uh, with like, I don't want to say a, like a vengeance because like the play didn't do anything to them. Like, you know, like they weren't wronged by the play, yeah. but they like really attacked it from the beginning with a lot of passion. Um, and, and that was wonderful. And that's, and, and that's like, that takes you, that, that really takes you far as a director because when, when you have, when you have your actors show up with that kind of passion, that yeah. just feeds into the passion that you already have for the project. And it's just, so it's just wonderful. It's just this wonderful give and take. And then we just, we, we fill each other up and we fuel each other and it's, it's wonderful. So, um, I, I couldn't ask for a, a better group of people. Um, and I, 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 I want to make sure I, I mention all of them, but, um, Tara, uh, Tara Herwig, um, who I work with here full time, um, she's our Gamut's executive assistant, um, who's playing the role of Arkadina, um, is 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 finding just such wonderful things. Uh, Jeff Ludermoser, who's playing Tregorin, um, just all of them. Uh, Amber Amber Mann, um, Amber Wagner Mann, who's playing Nina. Uh, Jordan Payne, J.C. Payne. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He goes play, yeah, yeah. Playing, playing Constantine, um, and and really continuing to find so many wonderful discoveries. Um, Andrew Nyberg, who's also uh, our scenic designer, uh, is playing Medvedenko. Now for the for the company and this production. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So Andrew is our resident scenic designer here, and he's also he's, he designed the set for the Seagull. Um, uh, Francesca Amandolia, who's playing um, Paulina, um, and Clark Nicholson, who's our artistic director, who's playing the role of Dorn, um, opposite uh, Francesca in a lot of ways. And they're, it's just so fun to watch the two of them play. Um, they're having such a great time with it. 
um, Frank Henley um, yeah. coming back to Gamut, um, uh, to Gamut stage rather, because he did direct for, uh, he did direct for a stage door series earlier in the season. Um, Michelle K. Smith playing Masha. Um, uh, James Kevin Cochran playing Yaakov. C.J. McConnell, wonderful young man who's playing our cook. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's great. It's just like it's such a it's such a wonderful. A uh, wonderful group of people, and I, I, I'm, I, so thankful for them because, like I said, they've they've worked so hard um, from the jump with this thing, and it's it's just been so great to to work with all of them. Um, but uh, but to come to your to your next point, um, Chekhov did not write anything specific about race. Okay, um, and. Uh, and and our our cast is, and and our cast is what it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, that was that that just sort of happened the way it did. But like, I couldn't think. I can't think of anybody else that I that I would want in these roles. You know. Yeah, definitely. You know, and it's it, it's great, and it's and it's wonderful to um, to to see all of them play together. It's great. Yeah, it's really nice. It's something that, uh, speaking with some of the uh, younger members of the theater community who mm-hmm. are also still in school and the like, <clears throat> who I've worked with, uh, seeing the faces in the advertising was yeah. something that had come up, and so that's the only reason I initially uh, wanted to make a comment about yeah. it. But uh, it well, is, it's very impressive. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, um, uh, Jordan um, is is playing Tara's son. Yeah. And Jordan and Tara are, are not the same race. Mm-hmm. Um and if that bothers anyone in the audience, if they're not able to to move beyond that, then mm. uh, that's really their problem. Definitely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but like, and to, and like, I don't see any reason why it it can't be that way. You know, um, and and I knew when it even in auditions when when I saw Tara and and Jordan reading together, I was like, that's it right there. Yeah, that's it. And so if, if you have, if you're, let's say you're doing death of a salesman, Mm -hmm. you know, and you know, Biff is one race and happy is the other race, then that's just what it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just what it is. And I think it's, and I think it's, I think it's important. Um, I really do. And I think that if, if, if a, if a company is, is going to be, um, committed to, uh, to, to diversity, yeah. then I think that I think that like it's it needs to be an active commitment. Yes. Um, so and and that's just the way that's the way I feel about that. Um, I think that it's 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 one thing to say like well this is this is the way it should be, but it's another thing to say okay well the what are what are we actively doing to make sure that that happens, especially in a city like Harrisburg. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, okay, wonderful. Uh, moving forward, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Hold on. It's all right. It's all right. I have my question. Yeah. Uh, You're lost in my eyes. This is this is true. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. Uh, I I have heard the term Dreamweaver used about you. <laughs> so that 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 could that could be it. Yeah, it's my uh, that's yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, just, yeah I, I don't know. <laughs> no, um, I actually one of the questions I had had. Uh, when JC had been cast in the show, I had said, uh, well, who's the seagull? And he, and he laughed and said, and said, I don't know. So <laughs> all the characters you just mentioned, uh, th- there, uh, is anyone playing the seagull? Is that? That's actually a really good question. And we've joked about it. Um, we've joked about it a lot. Uh, like just, you know, around the office and stuff like that, because like the, the seagull, is it's such a symbolic thing in the play. Like there is there is an, an actual there's a an actual seagull that that uh, plays a, a pretty important role in the play. Um, but when we talk about what the seagull is, kind of in other broader, more symbolic terms, I I think that there's a moment in the play where every single one of those characters fulfills that meaning in one way or another. Um, so probably the character that is referred to the most 
as such w- would be um, the, the the role of Nina, um, who's, who's played by Amber, um, because there's there's a there's a direct relation that is made. She's like, oh, and, and she's the one that has the, the famous lines like, "I'm a seagull." No, that's not it. Um, but there are moments when when Trigorin is fulfilling that role of the seagull. There are moments, uh, obviously, when 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 Constantine is. There are moments when when Arkady not. Uh, so I so the seagull is sort of a. Everyone kind of fills that role at some point, but we were joking because we were like, "Well, who's who's going to be the seagull? Like, who can we get?" in like a big white chicken costume <laughs> and just like kind of put them up in the in the catwalk that we have like above the theater and they're just like kind of up there the whole time whenever they refer to the seagull they just kind of like look up and they <laughs> wave so like I, I there there are a few people on that list but I just I, you know I didn't know I didn't, we couldn't find anybody that was willing to do it so well, I guess <laughs> I, I guess for our generation the most popular or famous seagull would have been Buddy Hackett in, <laughs> in the Little Mermaid <laughs> that's right so that's right yeah yeah, no, it's um yeah, it, it was a it was a thing and but there's actually like I said that there is there's a there's a seagull like that um that that pops up at the end. We're in the office by the way. Uh it's the <laughs> phone ringing and it's just going to continue to ring until it goes to voicemail. Well, that's um, all right. We can we can either wait that out and any other ambient noise you hear is the noise of being in a theater. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um yeah, so I guess yeah, but the thing about about that, like we're the the hard thing about doing a play like the seagull is you actually have to find a seagull, like not not like a like a. I mean, I guess there have been some productions that have actually used a real like dead seagull. I'm sure somewhere. Yeah. Um, but there's a moment in the play. This is not giving anything away. But there's a moment in the play where a character presents a seagull that he has killed to another character. Um, and this, this, this offering that's made. And, um, so one of our, one of the challenges that our props designer, um, the amazing Karen Rook, um, has been to, uh, to find, to find a seagull. And, um, it was, it was funny because like we were, uh, I was on the phone with, uh, Don Elsadek a couple of weeks ago because we share, we were sharing cast members at the time. There are some cast, cast members in Bill W and Dr. Bob, uh, um, not, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, and then and, and then also in mine. Um, so we were trying to work out some scheduling things together, and like he and he said, "Oh, you know, just uh, you know." And by the way, uh, if you can think of anybody um, for for any of these roles that I, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, you know, just just let me know. And I said, "Okay, yeah." And I said, "Like, and also if you have a if you have a like a hand on like where we could find a seagull." You know that that'd be that'd be cool. It's like and then you can, like and we left the conversation, and I said like, well, yeah, Don, I'll I'll, I'll be sure if I think of somebody, I'll let you know. And then he, and then he said, and if I find a dead bird, I'll let you know. And then he hung up. <laughs> it was great. It was great. It was just like it was just <laughs> Don Alcidek. Yes, down to a T. Taking it out of the park again, like he does. But it was just it was it was a fun conversation. For anyone who doesn't know, Don Alcidek is the artistic director at uh, Open Stage of Harrisburg, uh, <laughs> the the other regional theater that we have in our area. Uh, but okay, <laughs> well, if you need to find a seagull, I've always said that I believe seagulls are born in shopping center parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. So we, I, I, yeah, we're getting it figured out. We 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 got a seagull. Okay. We got a seagull. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I guess uh, as we come towards the end of the interview, I don't want to uh, ask you too many questions about your process or the like while you're still in it, but uh, if you could uh, give any, any story that you'd like to share or any, any thing that you could say has been the most favorite part of directing for you or directing this project. Yeah, um, there was uh, early on, um, before we really jumped into any of the blocking rehearsals, there was there was a night of what we call uh, just uh, again what we call character work, and I didn't know quite what to expect um, when I when I tasked them all with this with this thing after the read through, um, but uh, and this is a I had them do an exercise that's kind of close to something that you would do like in an acting class in 
in, in any kind of training program. And, and it, it was, it was um, but it was also something that I, I had run into when um, I was working at uh, Great Lakes Theater Festival um, when I was right out of college, which is in Cleveland. And we were doing a production of As You Like It, and our director, um, her name was Risa Brainin, and she devoted two full days of rehearsal to this thing that she called Happy Sads. And um, it's where everybody in the play, doesn't matter whether they're playing Hamlet or whether they're playing like the second guard on the left, like every, everybody has the time that they need to present the happiest moment in their character's life and the saddest moment in their character's life up until the point of the play. And it was something that like, a lot of the like the older actors were just kind of like, why are we doing this? And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but then like when everybody when everybody was in the room and, and everybody could present and like show these moments, whatever they were, um, an amazing thing happened because like you because it it sh it really got you to think about these people beyond the page and like characters that you may not even interact with, but like it really helped to define a life. So I. I um I asked members of my cast because we had we had one night, and so I'd ask them like I'd like to see everyone's happy sads, and you can you can use each other however you will like if let's say you want to go back to a moment when you were seven and you need someone to play your dad just like ask someone here to play that you know and like just talk to each other and it's like and it sounds like when I describe it it sounds very like kind of like real artsy man and like we're just gonna do this and like and and it's all and, and it almost like therapeutic but like I I and I never know what to expect when I ask when I ask um, anyone to do these things so I was blown away by what by what they all had to show me um, and and I like it and, and I want to get into like specific details because like there were some very very vulnerable very personal moments that were happening um, also there's some really hilarious things that happened, and I don't think that you would mind me saying this, but, like, CJ, who played our cook, like, proceeded to, like, make a salad. He brought in all of this, like, fresh produce, and, like, he made, like, one of the most amazing salads I've ever seen. I think it took him, like, 45 minutes. At least that's how long it felt. Like, that's, like, how long <laughs> it felt. But, like, he was, like, dicing everything up, and, like, and just, like, he, but he just totally immersed himself into, into that into that exercise, and um, and it was really really cool to see that, and uh, and I learned a lot, not only about the characters and about the story, but I learned a lot about the people that I was going to be working with over the next several weeks. Yeah. Um, so it was a it was a good night. It was a really good night, and I and I think that it was a it was a kind of a turning point for all of us very early on in the process, if you can have a turning point that early, but like it was a, I think it was a moment where it was like, everyone was like, okay, we're in this. Yeah. We're going to do this. Let's do this. So it was, it was pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah. It was nice. Well, thank you so much for talking. Um, yeah. The show is The Seagull by Anton Chekhov and the dates, do you have them? Yeah. We open March 12th um, and then we play through March 26th. So it's uh, Fridays and Saturdays at 730 and then Sundays at 2.30, um, Sundays are always uh, bring your own price. Okay. So, um, and, th and those, those performances are, uh, typically sell pretty well. So you want to be here um, around 2 o'clock or so um, for the, for the 2.30 show to make sure that you get a seat. Um, but we're also, uh, the Seagulls um, going to be playing on uh, Third in the Berg. And we always, uh, since we're a Third in the Berg venue now, um, we offer um, buy one get one free tickets on uh, the Friday of Third in the Berg. So that's nice. Where play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you so much, and looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for talking. Um, you just wanted to like. So. Uh, <laughs> so okay. There's a little add-on at the end here. Uh, we've been we've been talking like for the last 15 minutes. Yeah. That. After, just, after <laughs> the official end, uh, ending of recording. Uh, we were uh, shooting the shit, pardon the language, and... Uh, oh, you can swear on this? Uh, sure. Okay, I mean, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with the one and see okay, afterwards. All right. uh, but we were talking about the show, and uh, earlier in the podcast, he had said he would get back to something, and he realized he hadn't, so 
please, uh, dis- you're discussing the inaugural production of this show? Yeah, yeah. So when, when The Seagull was, was first produced, um, there's, there's, a, there's a famous story about its opening night, um, which was a disaster. It, was, it did not go well. Um, the audience did not get it. Um, the actress uh, playing Nina lost her voice because she was so nervous and she was so thrown by everything that like like just out of just out of anxiety her voice just went away she didn't have it um and uh Chekhov who was there um actually couldn't watch it like it 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 reached like intermission and he had he was just like I I can't do this I can't watch it it's awful and he never got over it he never got over that first performance and the first performance was such a disaster that he left and he fled and he and he went back to he went back to his home in the country and he started receiving all of these like notices and these letters saying that like your your play is 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 um selling to to you know like the sold out houses um and and people are really loving it and he thought that like he was being teased he thought that oh. people were like joking with him yeah. and like um but it turns out that it was like once it got past that performance, yeah. um, something clicked. And then that production was done. And uh, he received word from a theater company in Moscow um, that wanted to produce the play. And again, he, was, he thought, like, well, this, they, this can't be serious. You know, like it, like you, and, and, I, and I understand it. Like, as, as an artist, you know, like, I think we have all felt we we all are hanging on to that one thing yeah. that didn't go well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The white whale. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And like so, you know, and and Chekhov's white whale was a you know white seagull. So like, <laughs> um, that's lame. But, but it's true. But you know. But so anyway, so he receives notice from this uh, theater company in Moscow that wanted to produce the seagull. Um, guy named Stanislavski, ah. and. Uh, and it took a lot of coaxing for him to uh, to allow it to be produced again, um, but he did. And so um, Stanislavski's company, the Moscow uh, Art Theater, um, produced it, and that's the famous production. That's the one that um, like really got the attention, that really changed the course of things. Um, but it's but uh, interestingly enough though it didn't quite change Chekhov's belief in himself because those like the the wounds from that opening night never really healed and after every play that he wrote he always swore that he was never going to write another one oh. but then he always did um, but uh, but yeah that that production Stanislavski played uh, Trigorin and um, uh, his his uh, wife to be uh, Olga was in it. Um, uh, Meyerhold played uh, Constantine, and uh, it was a it was a really, and and that was and that production opened the door for him to write Uncle Vanya, okay. and then to write Three Sisters, and then ultimately, The Cherry Orchard. So, um, so like that's so so that's kind of like what happened. But like uh, the thing that they, the thing that they ended up discovering, um, like Chekhov ended up placing a lot of trust in that company because it, because it seemed like they got it. Yeah. You know, they understood, um, and Stanislavski coming at acting from in a, in a way that nobody had ever seen before. Yeah. Um, so again, all the stuff aligned, um, for, for that to happen, um, and for, for, and for it to happen well. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a neat story. Um, but there's a, there's a famous picture, um, I love it, and I, I, I need to like get it framed or something like that, but there's a picture of um, Chekhov reading the play to the company, and Stanislavski is like kind of standing behind him, and then like Olga, his, you know, his wife is like sitting over there, and you know, like, and Meyerhold is off to the side, just like brooding and looking, looking handsome and artistic, so he's the perfect Constantine. Um, so it, but it's a really, it's, a, it's this famous picture of Chekhov reading his work to that company. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool thing. So that, that, that's just the, that's just the, the nerd in me just wanted to like get that up. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always appreciative of nerdy stories. Yeah. Yeah. So there it was. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, and I just have to say, I went through uh, the cast list, and I, I, very very inadvertently left failed to mention um, the our Soren in this production is being played by Jeff Wasilewski, um, who is a wonderfully warm human being, but also uh, an incredible actor. Um, uh, he he's, uh, did the production of uh, Bill W. at Open Stage. Um, he's done countless other things. He's worked with, with Gamut before. Um, but he's really finding some wonderful things as, as this old, uh, aging, retired Russian um, and, and is really adding such warmth and humor to a character that I really didn't see before and 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 Jeff, I'm sorry that I didn't mention you in the initial list, but uh, you got like a like a minute long shout out from me. <laughs> so so there you go, man. But uh, but yeah, so it's just it's just a, a really great cast and couldn't be happier. Awesome. 